Today our study is going to center in on the kingship of Hezekiah. You can read in detail about his kingship in 2 Kings chapters 18 through 20, Isaiah 36 through 39, and 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. Now if you remember, after Solomon reigned, Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. And Judah, the southern kingdom, for the most part, was the most faithful part of the people of God. And that is where Hezekiah was king. He ruled the southern kingdom, Judah, from about 728 B.C. to about 699 B.C. Now, his kingship was very significant because it was right at the beginning of his kingship, about six years into it, that Israel was taken into exile by the Assyrians. But because of the righteousness and the faith of Hezekiah and Isaiah, the people of God in Jerusalem and Judea stayed faithful to the Lord. Amen, guys? And yet at the same time, it was a very, very dark hour for the people of God. You know, yesterday, I think, for the most part, went a bit unnoticed that it was the 45th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And I still remember that. I was in fifth grade. I was nine years old and uh, lived outside of Boston at that time. And, of course, being in that part of the country when Kennedy was assassinated, I, I still remember the family being downstairs, little black and white TV, watching all of the reports, all of the funeral proceedings. I mean, it was, it was such an intense and dark time for America. During that time, of course, during Kennedy's years as well as afterwards, one of the great struggles in America was the civil rights movement and for the most part led by Martin Luther King Jr. And it was a terrible time in America. It was a dark hour. And yet in the midst of that dark hour, one song began to be sung by the people who really believed in equality between men of all races. And that song was, We Shall Overcome. And you would see people that would be so united. I mean, they, they would be attacked, they would be scorned, they would be ridiculed, and, and yet they would be arm in arm, locked together. Sometimes fighting off hoses of water that would be shot right at them, and yet they would keep on singing, we shall overcome. And of course, the last part of it is, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. You know, right now, is a very dark time in America, as a matter of fact, in the whole world. And if there's anything that as disciples we need to have the mindset of, it's that we shall overcome. Amen. The title of our lesson comes from the words of the song, Deep in My Heart, I Do Believe We Shall Overcome, Deep in My Heart. The three points are simple. Number one, we shall overcome. Number two, the Lord will see us through. And number three, it's on to victory. Let's study about the dark days of Hezekiah and let's make some parallels between our days today. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Read this. Verse 1. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now, that's not his direct father, that's his lineage. As a matter of fact, if you read back in chapter 28, you will find that his actual dad, Ahaz, was a very evil king. As a matter of fact, he was so evil that he shut the doors of the temple to the worship of Jehovah God. But here's what Hezekiah does. Verse 3. In the first month, right at the beginning, of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side and said, Listen to me, Levites. 
Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your fathers. Remove all the defilement from the sanctuary. Our fathers were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and forsook him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They didn't burn incense or present any burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn. As you can see with your own eyes, this is why our fathers have fallen by the sword and why our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Now, I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now. For the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and to serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. And the church said, I mean, that's an exciting first month of his reign. Would you not say? And the thing that stands out right immediately for me is Hezekiah's reminder of what they saw as the present day situation that was there in Judah, as a matter of fact, in all Israel. At this point, of course, Israel's not been taken into captivity yet. At the same time, he says, look, the unfaithfulness of our forefathers who turned their backs on God has caused his people to become the dread and the horror and the scorn of the nations. That is a dark day for the people of God. Amen, church? You know, one thing that the obvious that's being stated right here is what he says in verse 6, our fathers were unfaithful. (laughs) Have you ever considered the fact that most everyone believes or accepts the religion of their parents? Have Have you ever noticed that? I mean, if your parents were Buddhist, you end up usually, what, Buddhist, right? If your parents were atheist, you usually end up atheist. If your parents were Catholic, Catholic, and so on. Well, the Bible has much to say about this, and it's very straightforward. If you turn to 1 Peter. In chapter 1, verse 1, Peter writes, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. He's talking to the disciples. Be self-controlled and set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish. Right here, Peter reminds them that their forefathers did not have the answer. Many of them indeed acted in ignorance, but they were separated from God. Getting back right here to 2 Chronicles, we understand something that the true believer must come to a deep conviction of, is that God does not have any grandchildren. Either you're a son and a daughter of God, or you do not know God. You do not get your faith from your parents. You must have your own faith. As a matter of fact, many of our fathers and mothers, though well-intended, did not follow the way of God. You can look at their lives. You can look at the outcome of their life. And right here, Hezekiah recognizes that his dad had shut the very temple of God. And yet he takes a stand. He deals in his own heart against sentimentality. And he chooses to follow God and his word. 
You know, it's very interesting to me. When we study with people, they can accept that you've got to have faith in Jesus Christ to be a disciple. They can accept that you've got to repent of your sins. They can accept that you've got to be a disciple. They can accept that you've got to be baptized to be saved, Acts 2.38. But when that application is made back on their family or their friends, all of a sudden things get confusing. Or perhaps there's a loved one that, that died without coming to a knowledge of the truth. Once more, there's a confusion here because of sentimentality. And the issue that confronts every believer is this. Am I going to follow God by following his word and not giving in to sentimentality? That's interesting. The first thing he calls the people to do is to consecrate themselves. It's to separate themselves. You know, it's amazing to me how the world just permeates the church. And we have to fight it off all the time. I mean, the church is supposed to be the light of the world. And yet we can allow all the things that are going on globally and nationally, and we can have the same dark view of life that the whole world is taking on. Even this morning, I read on the internet, it said, the American economy is in free fall. Now, translated, it means we haven't hit bottom yet. And that's where we're at. And, you know, for a lot of people, they really go, oh, no. We need to understand, we are called upon as God's children to be the light of the world. And we need to get a conviction. Where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. This hour was meant for Jesus and his people to shine the brightest. And we have got to stop being sentimental about the implications of the truth and say, listen, we are the people of God And we are going to follow the word of God no matter what. Are you with me here, church? And yet we bring in terminology even into our fellowship. That's very humanistic. We talk about being numb. You ever said that? And yet the Bible says lukewarmness in Revelation 3 is a sin. We talk about our insecurities. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it says, cowards go to hell. We say we just can't change that sin. In Revelation 21, 8, it says, unbelief will send you to hell. We talk about, I'm so stressed out. I just can't sleep. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14 talks about how God sent an evil spirit to Saul that tormented him. See, it's not stress, it's tormentation. We talk about, I'm so hurt, I'm so damaged. But Hebrews 12 talks about being unforgiving and bitter. I feel so unmotivated. And yet, 2 Corinthians 5, Paul reminds us that we are compelled, we are motivated by the grace of God. See, we have got to stop our humanistic talk our humanistic thinking, and stop having the world just permeate our minds and our heart and start being the church of Jesus Christ that is the light and the hope of a lost world. Are you with me here, church? After he calls them to consecrate themselves, look what he says right here. Verse 11. My sons, do not be negligent. The Lord has chosen you to stand before him and to serve him, to minister before him and to burn incense. To be negligent is to disregard something by not doing it. James 4, 17 says, if you know the good you ought to do and you do not do it, it is what? How many churches are negligent when it comes to the great commission to go to all nations? How many churches are negligent When the call comes to make disciples and, therefore, to be disciples and to call one another to obey the word of God. How many churches are negligent? Have we talked about for the past three weeks in our love one for 
another. That's how the world will know that we're God's disciples, by our love one for another. Let's get practical. This week, have you made sure that everybody in your Bible talk has got some place to go for Thanksgiving? Do you realize that times like Thanksgiving and Christmas are the times when people think most about suicide? I mean, I was taken aback yesterday. I, I read on the internet about a, a young man in Florida who had a web broadcast of his suicide. That was the way he wanted to impact the world. See, there's something inside of us that says, I want to make a difference. Now, he was twisted in his thinking like Satan will do. In his own mind, he was thinking, oh, now I'm giving, I'm going to show people it's okay to commit suicide. What a wicked, sinful, satanic twisting of the truth. And yet it's at this time that even disciples can go into depression. And my question is, are you negligent? Are you taking care of the people in your Bible talk that don't have family in town or perhaps aren't close to their family? Are you pulling them on in and truly loving one another as Jesus loved us? It's time for us to be a church that consecrates itself. To get rid of the humanism in our thinking and in our hearts. It's time for us to stop being negligent of what the Lord has called us to. Well, this is incredible. You can read about all the different things that Hezekiah did. But I love this at the end of chapter 29. In verse 35 it says, So the service of the temple of the Lord was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people. Because it was done so Quickly, does that fire you on up? Changes were made amongst God's people so quickly. Now, prayerfully, everybody got a handout. Did everybody get a handout? Did we get those out? And it's Thanksgiving season, right? Amen, church? And the whole idea of Thanksgiving is to be thankful. (laughs) And sometimes we have to have some, some tangible things to really make us thankful. You for those that don't know, for those that are visiting, for those recently baptized, uh, the church here has only existed for 18 months. And yet the Lord has blessed us, not just with the fellowship that you see here and the Latin ministry that's catacorned to us on over here, as well as all the children that you can hear right behind here. But we have sent out in 2008 three different church plantings, Honolulu, New York City, and Portland, and we support Santiago, Chile for $3,500 a month. Now, it probably would be enough in our first full year of existence to have a baby church grow to 350 in attendance. That's pretty awesome, amen, guys? I mean, you see that right here at the attendance. We have over 200 disciples. We've had, we'll have over 90 baptisms today, uh, 26 restorations, 36 place membership, and our giving is about 8500 But that's not really the full impact of this church. The full impact of this church gets multiplied with Honolulu and their 16 attendants. New York and their 27 disciples. In Portland and their 134 in attendance. And in Santiago with their now 53 disciples. And you can look at the bottom. All all just this year, this is what you, God's church here in this place, have had an impact The attendance is nearing 700 in all these churches. Disciples, almost 400. Baptists, almost 150. And we're giving almost $14,000 a Sunday. Is that incredible? Just the first full year of existence. Well, what, what was the heart back in the Bible? Well, the Bible says right here, Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people because it was done so quickly. In our hearts this morning, we should just be flat fired up to see what God has done amongst us so quickly. Are you with me here, church? Amen. Let's keep marching on right here. We shall overcome. Point two, the Lord will see us through. Chapter 30, verse 1. Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now remember, this is taking place right at the beginning of Hezekiah's reign before Israel's been taken into exile. So what happens? The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decide to celebrate the Passover in the second month. They had not been able to celebrate at the regular time because there weren't enough priests who had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. I mean, 
there weren't enough priests to minister to the people. Look at this, verse 4. The plan seemed right to both the king and the whole assembly. You know something? you got to have plans if you want to do great things. Amen, guys? Amen. Verse 5. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan, from the bottom south to all the way to the north, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. Wow. Right here, they were just so amazed at what God was doing. They said, listen, we know what it takes to be a purified people of God. you got to consecrate yourself. you got to repent. you got to be the people of God and stop neglecting the word of God and start being what God has called us to be. Now, we need to start to reestablish the Passover because we need to remember that God brought us out of Egypt, out of slavery, and gave us a people that were his very own. We were saved by God. That was the purpose of the Passover, amen? And they wanted to remember that again. And they said, you know, we've got it right here in Jerusalem. We need to send the word out not only throughout all Judah, but we need to get out through all the rest of Israel, to Manasseh, to Ephraim, to all these places. And that way, we can get everybody, as the Bible says, to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover in large numbers. Well, let's see how all the people responded to this. That's an exciting plan, is it not, church? Verse 10. The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun. But the people scorned and ridiculed them. Wow. These people are supposed to be believers. And this call to go back to God is scorn. And it's ridiculed. Nevertheless, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind to carry out what the king and his officials ordered, following the word of the Lord. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the unleavened bread in the second month. Is that exciting or not? You know, very often, when God puts a plan on the heart of his people, to do great things that affect large numbers. It shocks, it shocks some to understand that there are people who call themselves believers when they hear this plan and they ridicule it with scorn. Does that blow your mind? Well, that's what happened right here. Now, they went ahead and celebrated the Passover. Well, well, how did it go? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 22, Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all the Levites who showed good understanding of the service of the Lord. For seven days they ate their assigned portions and offered fellowship offering and praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. The whole assembly then agreed to celebrate the festival seven more days. So for another seven days, they celebrated joyfully. They were so fired up for the first week, they go, let's just go another week. They were, they were, don't you think they were really fired up? What was the whole issue of the Passover? It was being thankful. They enjoyed being thankful for one week. They go, let's just be thankful a second week. This is a lot of fun. See, a lot of people think being committed to God is not that much fun. Let me tell you something. It's the funnest, most enjoyable place to be in your heart. Because what the true disciple, the true Christian, the true believer has in their heart is just overwhelming thankfulness. I am thankful to you, God, for calling me out of slavery and giving me an eternal hope. You know, I'm, I'm very excited for Alex and Terry today getting baptized. And we're going to be able to see those two young ladies get baptized in the Lord. And you know, I, I, I've been a Christian for, for, for many, many years. And you know something? Seeing baptisms never grows old. Because each one is a miracle. You know, doesn't it fascinate you? Have you ever heard someone tell their conversion story and go, oh, that was boring? No. <laughs> no, no, no. There is no such thing as a boring conversion story. Because each one is about God changing that person's life. And you know, when you see a baptism, you go, you know something, I need to just be more thankful. <laughs> you know, it really is it's just all about God. Just all about salvation. Here I'm hung up on global warming and global fiscal issues. 
I just need to be thankful I'm saved. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So they celebrate seven more days. It's pretty cool. Verse 26. There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Woo! <laughs> there had been nothing like this since Solomon. Wow. Now, what's the date here again? Eh, give or take a little bit. It's about 728, 727 B.C. Solomon rules. Eh, give or take a little bit, about 950 to 900 B.C. For a few hundred years, there'd been nothing like this. Wow. The specialness they were feeling, is that pretty cool? It's like, man, this, there's just, there's been nothing like this. This is absolutely incredible, and I'm a part of it. Look at this. The priests and Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them, for their prayers reached heaven, his holy dwelling place. Have you ever had prayers you didn't think reached heaven? And you're probably right. Still, it just doesn't get past the ceiling? It's because you've not been the man or the woman of God you need to be. And there's an intuitive sense. We go, my prayers are getting nowhere. Now, praise God, he's a God of mercy, and he'll forgive us when our prayers start to become, Lord, I have sinned, forgive me. But the reason many prayers are not, quote, in our minds answered, in fact, they are answered, it's no. <laughs> and the reason you don't move the heart of God is your prayers aren't making it by, by the ceiling. These people consecrated themselves. They just got thankful. They're going, I'm just fired up to be here in Jerusalem. I'm so fired up. I, I want to I celebrate Passover another week. It's awesome. had been seen for hundreds of years. Well, what happens? Well, 31, verse 2. Hezekiah assigned the priests and Levites to divisions, each of them according to the duties of the priests of Levites, or to burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks, and sing praise at the gates of the Lord's dwelling. Is that cool or not? The king contributed from his own possession for the morning and evening burnt offerings, and for the burnt offerings on the Sabbaths and new moons, an appointed feast is written in the law of the Lord. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, oil, and honey, and all that the fields produced. They brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. The men of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in heaps. They began doing this in the third month and finished in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed the people. You know why? There weren't many Levites that were ready to serve the Lord and lead the people. People no longer were sacrificing. When thankfulness came back into the people and the leadership stepped forward, Hezekiah said, listen, here's what I'm sacrificing, not out of the king treasure, but my personal treasure. What happens to the people? They start going, man, we need to obey the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was to give a tithe of everything. And the people, it was just, it was, it was amazing. They started bringing heaps of stuff. All the first fruits. They're just heaps. You know, uh, the Lord allowed Elena and myself to be a part of a very special ministry for three and a half years in Portland, Oregon. And we went there with a dream that the world could be evangelized in a generation. And at the time, we started out with just a few disciples that, that were there. But soon the Lord began to bless, and people from afar began to come. Staggeringly, they would, they would move across country, giving up everything they have, so they could move to Portland, Oregon. <laughs> What's in Portland, Oregon? A lot of rain. Yeah. 
this is, this, we have this kind of weather for about six, seven months. This is a great day. You should see what the winters are like. Yeah, all of us Portland people, we're fired up today. It's a beautiful day out. It's no rain. <laughs> I mean, and, and in the midst of this, all these people coming, there was such joy when they came because they found a group of like-minded people that shared a dream to consecrate themselves, to be holy before the Lord, to give up all of the past sins of our forefathers, and to be a people that God would call his own. Well, one particular family that did this was Pat and Lisa Nebaker. They came all the way from Tennessee. They came all the way from Tennessee. And when they came, they were, they were excited. And they, they dragged along her then 19-year-old son. Now, he, she, she had him from a previous relationship. And he'd been around the church a long time, and the church had faded where they were at in Tennessee. And when he came, there was some interest, but didn't come much. And then some things happened. The church began to fade in Portland. And some people said, you know something? It's just time for us to start again and start a church where everybody's like-minded yeah. with the dream to evangelize the world in a generation Amen. where everybody's called to be a disciple unapologetically, where we really believe that we're going to be part of a worldwide movement. And... The Nebuchadnezzar really studied things on out, particularly the issue of autonomy, and they came to a conviction. You know something? The Bible calls people to be in a movement to evangelize the world. Now, that doesn't mean if you're not in a movement, you're not saved. I mean, if you're a faithful disciple, you are saved. Amen, church? But if you're really going to have a high impact, you've got to be in a movement. And so Pat and Lisa, after studying, decided to join the new church just a couple of weeks ago. Well, of course... Their son Jeff had heard about all the rumblings and everything and wanted to know what was going to be different in this new church. So he came to church. When he came to church, he was blown away. He says, I haven't seen anything like this since I was a young boy. And my mom first started going to church. Well, he started studying, and today Jeff is being baptized into Christ. Is that awesome or not? Now, you, you talk about fired up. I mean, Jeff is fired up. But Pat and Lisa, they are beside themselves fired up. Because, I mean, here's Lisa who made a mistake as a young woman, having a child out of wedlock. And now to see her child become a disciple of Jesus Christ and not have to repeat all the sins of her, a forefather, or perhaps a foremother. Today also is a double contribution in Portland. We, just, we have just officially got the church rolling there just a few weeks ago. And to call the disciples to do a double contribution in the midst of this very trying economic time was tough. But you know, and I've talked to Pat the last couple of days. He and Lisa, they're going, hold, we're not giving two times, bro. We are so excited we get to give more. We are going to give so much. We are so excited because of what God is doing in our lives and what God has done through this church to help our son Jeff become a disciple. <laughs> He didn't say it in so many words, but they've decided to give heaps today. <laughs> See, what, what is giving all about? Giving is being thankful to the Lord for what you've got. You know, yesterday we had a financial meeting for the congregation. And at the financial meeting was, of course, Michael Kirshner and Nick Bordieri. Uh, the Antelons, Elena was there, of course, she serves as in some ways the accountant for the church, and then Elena and myself, and we had to lay out where we're at financially as well as where we're going to be going financially. And it was, it was a, a very stimulating, Bible-based conversation. But on our hearts was, was one simple thing that we were united on. We absolutely have all been personally affected by the financial crisis, U.S.-wise and globally. But we all understand that this is a moment. Yeah. It is a moment where it's darkest, where the light can shine brightest. We understand at this time that 
many in the world, and sadly, disciples are concerned about lost jobs, lost retirement, and lost homes. And so we talked about where our contribution was at. And sadly, as we, we got down to things, we, we came to a conviction that the, the church was not sacrificing all that needed to sacrifice. Hence the lesson today. The lesson is really not simply a call to give, but a call to be thankful. A call to understand that you are in a congregation where prayerfully you can say, I've not seen anything like this. A lot of you travel a long distance. You know, there are a lot of churches closer to where you go. You save a little bit of money on gas. But many of us that are members here, we really believe that this is a congregation that is unique in Los Angeles. Not in the sense that we're the only Christians. There are other Christians and other fellowships. But we are unique in the sense that we believe that God has called us to evangelize the world in this generation. We believe that we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And that is to compose the visible church. And that is the way that God will multiply disciples. We believe it is our responsibility not only to evangelize this city, but to do everything we can with everything we are, with everything we possess to see the world evangelized in our generation. You know, with that in mind, we we talked very specifically what it was going to take. You know, we talked about it. And here's my convictions personally as your evangelist. Number one, In observing the giving that's gone on over the past several months, we have a lot of new Christians, for the most part young people, that sometimes don't give a penny to the work of the Lord. But the Bible says you're to give your first fruits. In this congregation, we call every member as the leadership to give a tithe. When I was a college student, back in 1972 when I got baptized, I gave $10 a week. You know what that translates? It's about $20 a week now. And I had a job to make sure that I could give. Because I wasn't going to use my mom and dad's money to give to the Lord. I wanted to give it to the Lord. I worked as a janitor from 11 to 2 at night. Just so I would have money to give. And a little bit of money to spend on dates. Amen. Well, I, I wanted to encourage the sisters. You know how it is. Just wanted to take care of things. As your evangelist to the young people and to the new Christians, I want to call you to repent and to be thankful. I'm not saying repent and give. I'm saying repent and be thankful because when you're thankful, you're going to bring in heaps. Are you with me right here? And you're going to start saying, man, I got I to get, get a couple more hours so I can give significant to the contribution. And that's what a college student should be giving. It's a sacrifice. 10, 20 bucks. Translated to Starbucks. One Chipotle and a Pepsi. That's that's the level of sacrifice. The other thing we looked at is the older members of the church and the older disciples. It's a funny thing. Sometimes older disciples can be less enthusiastic and thankful. And so I call you to repent. I want you to ask yourself a very fundamental question. Do you really believe that there are significant, unique aspects of this fellowship? If you don't, and you know, we really want you to be a member here. We really do. But if you don't, your life would be a lot easier. Just stop off a little church at the corner. You know. And probably there'd be more light in the building. You wouldn't have to hear all the kids. But see, we, we have a conviction that there's nothing exactly like this happening in Los Angeles. We're a radical group. As I said before, I don't think we're the only Christians. We're not the only ones saved. But I do believe there's uniqueness in this congregation to be filled with all disciples of Jesus Christ. Therefore, for the older disciples... In the Lord, I command you to repent and to be thankful. Now, when you're thankful, 
you're going to be like Pat and Lisa. You're going to start bringing the heaps because you're going to go, man, this is the hope for my kid. If this church isn't cranking, we don't have enough Levites serving up front. We're in trouble. Right now, not all of our regions have full-time people. You know, as a church, we could put on more people. Praise God, in this church, we've got more people that want to be in the ministry that right now we don't have the finances to put on. We set out by faith that this January, we're going to divide the North region into the North region, which Carlos and Lucy are going to lead, and the new Arts Media Sports Ministry region that the Williamsons are going to lead. Now... One of the things that's part of the glamour part of Los Angeles is all the young people that come to Los Angeles every day. Do you realize every day 300 young people move to Los Angeles to make it in the business as an actor, an actress, a musician, or something that's associated with the media? We've got to get to these young people. Are you with me right here? Therefore, we've laid out that come April 1 at our missions contribution, we're going to put Michael and Michelle on full time. Are you with me right here? Now, I've, we've already challenged Michael Michelle. You've got to downsize your life. You've got to take care of any debt that you've got if you're going to be a servant of the Lord. The church, Hezekiah set the pace. Me and Elena, we're stepping up. The church technically, as we always did in the Portland days, we, we ran out of money a little bit before the mission's contribution. And so we'll probably run out of money, as per usual, in January. Don't worry about it. God, God's still there. <laughs> but Elena and I will give a sizable sum, more than the 15 times, at that time in January to keep things going. And I know that a couple other brothers have volunteered to do the same until we make it to the special because we want people to have some breathing room to get to April. On the other hand, Elena and I really believe in what we're doing here. We believe there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Therefore... We're upping our contribution another 10%. We already give over a tithe. I'm saying we got to do something, guys. Our giving right now is 8500 To pay our bills, we've got to give about 10500 I really believe in this congregation we have the money. It's just do we have the faith? I mean, do we really believe? We shall overcome. But deep down in your heart, do you believe? You know, today, we're having the Bible talk leaders at 2.30 and then the house church leaders at 3. Why? Because at the, the financial meeting, we all came to a conviction that if we're going to be the kind of church that sacrifices, we just can't tell people to do that. Now, my job is to tell you to be grateful this week. Command you in the Lord to be grateful. But we got to have a plan. Amen. Right. And for a lot of us, we, we're not that good in finances. How do you know you're not good? Well, you're broke. <laughs> you're in debt. You're a person that's not good in finances. Yeah. See what I'm talking about right there? <laughs> Bottom line, you need discipling. You need discipling. And so today at the house church leaders meeting, Mike Kirsner is going to be preaching the word. Amen. And then... After he preaches, we're going to have each of the couples there select one of the four couples in our church, either the Bordieres or the McGee's or the Kirshners or the Untalots, who all do excellently in their finances to get discipling from. And we're going to fix up the leadership so we can get the leadership to really help out the entire congregation. What's it going to take in order to do that? Well, number one, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we've got to simplify our lives. I talked briefly about it. Starbucks is gone. Carpooling is in. Number two, we need to downsize. We need to downsize. Downsize the number of times that we eat out. Downsize, if we can, the rent that we pay. The number of cars that we drive. And because I think that a lot of us are very fearful of even losing our jobs... And therefore, we don't put the kingdom first because we know we can be neglectful. You know, like a lot of churches say, it's okay if you only come Sundays. Now, here in this congregation, 
We expect people to be here Sunday morning, amen, and be thankful, amen, midweek, Bible talk, and devotional, devotionals for the college and teens. And we expect someone, if there's a regular conflict, everybody has a conflict every blue moon. But if you have a regular conflict, we expect people to give up their job because we believe the kingdom is more important than a job and God can get you a job. Turn with me to Colossians 3. Now this passage... I'm going to talk a little bit about jobs for a second. Verse 22. Slaves obey your earthly masters and everything. Okay, now, obviously, as disciples, we don't believe in slavery. But we do look upon our bosses as masters. Amen, guys? (laughs) So, workers, slaves, obey your earthly masters, your bosses and everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I really believe that a lot of us are nervous about our job security because, number one, we don't believe that God will take care of us if we seek first the kingdom. And number two, it's because we're not excellent at our jobs. The Bible says at our jobs we need to be serving our bosses if they were Jesus. That's how excellent you need to be. You know, it's kind of interesting. We got with Blue Jack and his family for breakfast uh, Friday. And uh, it was a blessing to find out a little bit about his sister, Laura. She's a disciple. And we were challenging Blue Jack a little bit on his job situation. A little discipling in the Lord. Even song leaders need a little discipling in the Lord. <laughs> And it was great because Laura was able to share and remind Blue Jack of her life. She says, when I graduated from Pitzer College, now, Pitzer College is a cranking university. It's one of the Claremont schools, and the Claremont schools have more Rhodes Scholars come out of them than even Harvard. It's a cranking place. You come out of Pitzer College, you are supposed to get one cranking job. Well, this is about 15 years ago or so. Laura got, graduated from Pitzer. She couldn't find anything but a secretarial job. And she didn't know she was going to take it because, after all, she's from Pitzer. Secretary? Well, her dad, Big Lou, who is a disciple, up in heaven now, <laughs> rebuked her. <laughs> he says, listen, you'd be grateful you got a job. He says, you just don't do your job. You go there and you be excellent. You go there and don't just do what they tell you to do. You sweep the floors. You clean the bathrooms. You just be incredible. Sure enough, that's what she did. Fifteen years later, she's in upper management in the same company, making over $200,000 a year. Her job is secure. See, we need to get out of this worldly thinking. And we need to have a conviction. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And God will give you everything you need. Either that's true, either that's Bible, or it's not. We got to stop missing meaning of the bodies because of jobs. That's uncommitment. We got to start being grateful and thankful to God that we have a job. That we have money. That we're here in America with religious freedom. You know, our brother, Lola Loaf, was doing a Bible talk on Army Base over there at the Democratic Republic of Congo about three weeks ago. Just went in to do a Bible talk. <laughs> We've got five brothers that are, that are Army officers. And they have Bible talk. And so he goes on base and leads the Bible talk. Well, there was an, a lot of tension. One particular time he went on, he gets arrested for being a spy. He's in prison for two weeks because of being faithful. Some people say, well, that was stupid going on to an army base and endangering stuff. So let me tell you, if we're disciples, we do whatever it takes to preach the word. Yes, he's been freed. Amen, guys? 
But where is your conviction? Where is your thankfulness? You want security? Then you trust in the Lord. You want security in your job? Then you do excellent. You go beyond what your boss is asking you to do. And in that darkness called the workplace, you be the brightest light. Are you with me right here, church? Let me tell you something. The call for us all, simplify, downsize, and excel. We do that. The Lord will take care of us. Amen? Amen. Let's finish out our study. It's on to victory. Now, this next passage is going to throw you. Here I've been telling you all about what the Lord does good. And I want us to read something. At the very end of chapter 31, after they bring the heaps on in, amen, guys? It says in verse 20 of chapter 31, kind of a summary. This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. In everything that he undertook in the servants of God's temple in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. Is that flat awesome or not? Now look at the very next verse. After all that Hezekiah had done so faithfully, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah. Hold it! He's been faithful to the Lord. What's this guy Sennacherib doing now? Well, no one said that being a faithful person to God doesn't have its challenges. Evil is all around us. Evil is all around us. Well, what happens? Well, let's, let's go back to the king's account, 2 Kings. And... When we have more time, or if you have more time, go back and study it out in detail. I mean, it is just builds your faith. In 2 Kings chapter 18, we find that the commander of Sennacherib's army gives a message to Hezekiah. Verse 19, chapter 18, 2 Kings. The field commander said to them, tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you are depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds if he leads on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, You must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. The world is always trying to get you to make a bargain. The world is always trying to get you to compromise. Right here, the commander of the armies of the king of Assyria says, make a bargain with the king. Why are you so confident, Hezekiah? Read on. Chapter 19. When Hezekiah heard these words, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Elikim at the palace administrator, shipped out the secretary and the leading priests and all wearing sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, this is what Hezekiah says. This is the day, a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. As when children come to the point of birth and there's no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, pray for the remnant that still survives. Oh, baby. Hezekiah is being challenged. Also, at this point, we know that Isaiah is with him. And the words come. Where is this confidence of yours? Here's the cool part. Chapter 19, verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made the heaven and the earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the word Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. This is cranking. He gets the actual letter. And he says, I'm going to worship And I'm going to lay the letter out before the Lord. So he just lays out this letter to God. He says, God, I know you see everything. Do you see this letter right here? 
Do you see these words? Oh, where is your confidence? Do you see how he's insulting you? God, doesn't that tick you off? God, I'm praying to you, do something about this God that's insulting you. This is all about you. Don't worry about me. But God, he is really insulting you. He doesn't think you do nothing. Well, it's shortcut to the end. Verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Syrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So that trip, king of Assyria broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh, stayed there, and next verse says he got killed. I'm telling you, you got a problem? Take it to the Lord. Someone insults your faith? Someone's taking away your confidence? Just bring the letter to the Lord. Oh, it takes one angel. And the Bible says there are thousands upon thousands of angels. God goes, hey, one of you dudes, I want you taking care of the army of the Assyrians. You got one night, dude. Whammo. 185,000 guys are gone. That's one angel. That's our Lord. That's not even Lord himself. That's just an angel. That's just one of the servants. How much more powerful is our God himself? See, I believe we shall overcome. I believe the Lord will see us through. But bottom line, it's on the victory. See, that's what Hezekiah and Isaiah understood. It's all about God. It's all about God. You know it sad to me this past week there was a church that uh, decided to read as a midweek announcement that they were to have nothing to do with me and any of the leaders associated with me in the new movement what is our call to evangelize the world in a generation they scorn and they ridicule that are we to say oh woe is me no 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 this is to be expected Some of you people that are studying to be baptized. Some of you people that are going to be baptized. Some of you people that have been recently baptized. You need to understand that there are people who call themselves people of faith that are going to scorn and ridicule you for your convictions to be a sold-out disciple. And they will do anything to try to persuade you otherwise because that's not their lifestyle or their doctrine. And you need to wise up. Don't get faked out. Don't think, oh, now I'm a Christian and everything's good. No, now you're a Christian and the battle begins. That's why it says you're born again. Born is when you start. See, a lot of people think, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm studying. I got baptized. No, you're just starting. You're just starting. That's just the start. And if you're going to make it, you need to have a total trust in God. Because when hardships come, it's going to take you out because you're going to get bitter if you don't remember that God is in control. How many disciples have fallen away because of bitterness? You know, it staggers me what the Lord has done. I mean, I, I, me and Elena, we, we sometimes just kind of smile late at night and just think about the mercy of God and the grace of God giving us another chance to build a new movement. You know, people say, well, what's going to be the difference the second time around? I mean, can the second time be different? I always remind them the story of the people of God going in the promised land. The first time they lacked faith, the second time they got it done. The second time can and must be different, brothers and sisters. You know, we're just a two-year-old movement There are over 30 churches in 17 nations. Does that excite you? I don't know of anything like that happening. You know what's exciting? Just a few months ago, we announced our five-year plan. I mean, here we are. We're starting Mercy Worldwide. And that's officially going to start with our support starting in January. Nick and Denise are going to step up. Still going to have secular jobs, but nonetheless... 
we're going to be starting giving mercy to a lost world, taking care of the poor, the widows, and the orphan. That is true religion. 2010, if the Lord allows us to put before him the plans that, that we have, Lord willing, the Morenos and the Zindlers are going to be starting a new congregation in Miami, Florida. Amen, guys? In 2010, Lord willing, the Williams is going to lead a mission team to London, England. Is that fire you want up? 2011, Victor and Aurora are going to start a new church in Mexico City. 2012, well, when the, the Williamsons go to London, Tim and Leanne Kernan will move here for a couple years. And in 2012, we'll plant the church in Paris, France. And in 2013, if we can find a wife for him, Mike Underhill will go to Hong Kong to plant the church. You know, it's, it's exciting. I just got a call a couple weeks ago from a, a former full-time couple in the ICOC uh, in Albany, New York, and they're starting a new congregation in Albany. People, people want to be a part of something that's going to make a difference. Disciples are worried about this time of darkness, nationally and globally. No, 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 no. It is the hand of God. It is the hand of God handing us an opportunity. Because we as disciples need to have a deep conviction. That's where it's darkest, the light shines brightest. We need to have it deep in our hearts that we do believe. We shall overcome. We shall overcome any sin that comes our way. We shall overcome anyone that opposes us by a single angel of God. We shall overcome bringing as many people as possible to heaven. Yes, that begins with some repentance today. And the area we need to repent is just thankfulness. When we are thankful, when those cards are passed out next week, the financial meeting, we're not going to write down a buck if we're a college kid. We're going to go, hold on, I'm, I'm sacrificing. There's nothing like this. You've been around a while, you go, man, I got to dig deep. We're, we're up in our contribution. We got to get the Williamsons on full time. Whatever it takes, this is what we've got to do. Because just like Pat and Lisa Nebuchadnezzar realized, it's the only hope for our children. It's on to victory. Thank you. God bless you.